Shout out to the NRL SC Sponge, or otherwise known as Benny, who's an absolute legend on Twitter and in the Supercoach community, asking the hard-hitting questions. How are we going to field 17 players over the next five to six rounds? Your guess is as good as mine. Hello everyone, welcome to the round 20 trade targets and preview, or should we just call it the round 20 carnage? Because as if anyone is living under a rock in the NRL community, you'll know that we have been hit with plenty of injuries and suspensions, and it's going to take an absolute toll on our supercoach sides. A lot of teams struggling to even meet 17 players. I'm definitely falling into that category with multiple injuries in my team, but hopefully we can get through this all together. So if you guys enjoy the video and the sob stories, please give this video a like. Do please consider subscribing to the channel as well if you enjoy the content. Let's get straight into it. So a quick recap of how I performed in round 19. So I scored 1,303, which is an okay score, but not too great for the round. The rank dropped just a little bit to 2,701. Um, I was expecting that hit coming into the week, uh, but yep, given that I've got five trades there, I think that is the key number to focus on. I'm pretty happy with five trades. Obviously, I would wish for more, but I know a lot of people who are ranked higher than me have got a few trades less than me. So hopefully I can use these five trades well um, and hopefully get up towards the you know pointy end of the rankings for the end of the season. So there's so much to go through for Teamless Tuesday and all the injuries and suspensions. I thought it'd be best to separate them because there was just so many to go through. So we'll quickly just start off with the injuries. Sean Johnson, four to eight weeks, at best case, four weeks. That seems like he's going to be out though for, the, for our Supercoach season. So definitely is looking like a sell. And Fennel Blake actually is ranging between one to four weeks, depending on if his finger is a compound fracture or if it's a dislocation. Based on reports that the NRL physio has um, put out, um, it looks more like a dislocation. So it's actually a bit more hopeful that he could actually be back in the next one to two weeks. So he's definitely someone I'm looking at holding. Adam Fennel Blake. Matt Ikevalu is six to eight weeks, so he's not going to be back really for the Roosters until the finals. But for the purpose of Supercoach, he'll be out for the rest of the season, as is Billy Smith, who's unfortunately out for five months with his injury. Brian Toto, one of the biggest um, bombshells, basically, of the round. Four to six weeks, as best case scenario, with an ankle syndesmosis. Four to six weeks, again, puts him basically in round 24 or 25, which rules him out, essentially, for the Supercoach season. Isaiah Yo had a HIA, probably just going to be the one week, so not as bad of a concern. And Alex Johnson is potentially um, looking to be coming back in round 22 or round 23. Just the fact that he's coming back before the end of the Supercoach season, in my opinion, just means he's a hold because any warm bodies that we can throw out there is going to be a big plus for our sides. On the suspension front, Cam Murray is out for one game, Matt Lodge is also out for a game, Tom Flegler is out for two games, and Luke Thompson, it was confirmed earlier tonight, he is out for three games, so a big blow for any Supercoach players out there who own him, as well as Cam Murray, Matt Lodge, you know, they're pretty highly owned as well in Supercoach. In terms of the non-injury-related movements of teams in round 20, I've just tried to summarize it by some of the bigger key players instead of just going fully blown through every team. For the Roosters, Joey Martin moving to the wing is definitely going to be, I think, a beneficial thing for him for Supercoach because uh, they're more likely to finish the tries off in those attacking plays, so I really like Manu on the wing there. Adam Kieran moves into the centers, and he'd expect, well, I'd expect him to be taking over the goal kicking, so, you know, potentially taking some points away from Teddy and also Sam Walker. Siotio Takiyahu has been named on the bench, um, although that was the case last week, and we don't actually quite know if that's the case again, so definitely one to be keeping an eye on. The Roosters do play the first game of the round, so that does help that you can see the final team list before the first lockout happens. Mitchell Moses is still out for the Eels, so that, that, that does help uh, you know, Clint Gutherson in the, the fact that he's probably going to retain the goal-kicking duties um, f until Mitchell Moses comes back, which potentially might be next week or the week after that. For the Tigers and the Warriors match, Sean Bloor is starting as a result of injuries to Luke Garner and Alex Safarth, which is good for him. And if anyone has been holding him as a bit of a non-playing reserve, um, you know, that's another warm body you can throw out for this week. Cody Nikarima, I can't believe it. He's in my team. Uh, with Roger Tuvasashek leaving the Warriors this week, I thought Nikarima was going to be perfect to be playing in the starting halves. And they've got Sean O'Sullivan and Pedahiku. And Nikarima has been benched. So my starting half is benched, which is not fantastic, as is Jazz Tavanga, who was a bit of a, you know, a bit of a hot topic in the uh, past couple of weeks. But again, being named on the bench is not great for him. For the Rabbitohs match, Tane Milne was the only kind of big super coach kind of you know news I wanted to put in here. He's been named out of the 17 and is at 18th man. Definitely not good for his credentials. For the Knights versus the Raiders, Mitch Pierce has been named on an extended bench, so that definitely is good news for the Knights. You know, if he gets into the 17, come kickoff time. For the Raiders, Jordan Rapana is still named at fullback. Bailey Simonson though is named on the extended bench, so Rapana might only get maybe the one or two more games at fullback. Um, unless they put Bailey Simonson on the wing um, and Rapana ret retains his fullback spot for the next few weeks moving forward. 
for the Storm, big news here is that Cam Munster has been named to return, as is Harry Grant, who has been named on the extended bench. Um, but Ryan Pappenhausen has still been named on the bench as well, with Nico Hines still named at the starting fullback position. So definitely going to be very interesting to see how they will rotate their big gun players for the rest of the season. Um, for the Panthers, obviously Brian Toto is the key one who's been um, ruled out for this game. Tyron May has also been ruled out for the next few weeks as well, so Matt Burton does slide into the halves. But yeah, Penrith definitely hampered with uh, injuries, so you'd expect the Storm to be pretty comfortable winners in this game, although the Panthers still might be able to put up a fight in this one. And finally, for the Sharks versus Manly, Siusu Vitalikai is starting, but notably Teague Wilton has not been named in the 17, so that does mean that Talakai should hopefully get some extended minutes if you are currently holding him. Um, and Curtis Sirinan has been named on the bench for Manly, which potentially might uh, reduce the minutes of Hamale Ulukuatu and potentially even Josh Huster. We just don't quite know how the back row rotation is going to work for the Sea Eagles, but that is definitely something to keep an eye on as well if you're, say, looking to invest in a Ulukuatu. Hopefully that best summarizes all the key ins and outs of Teamless Tuesday. There's so much to go through. Now let's get into the hot topics of the round. So I kind of wanted to start off just, you know, giving a bit of a general discussion on how to best navigate your trades for this week. For me, there's pretty key, key things that I think you need to follow just to make sure that you're using your trades in the best way possible. Firstly, I think I'm trying to avoid trading healthy players if I can, just given that with so many injuries happening um, and in the next five weeks, you'd expect you know, even more to come, potentially restings from especially the big clubs like Melbourne, Penrith, maybe even the Rabbitohs, etc. You might see some you know, healthy players get rested. So that definitely is something to factor in in that you want to be saving your trades as much as you can. Second thing I'd also suggest is just setting up a team, just like, you know, pre-trades, just to see if you can even field a full 17 or if you can cover any injuries or suspensions. I put my team here below just as a bit of an example and also just to help get my own thoughts out about my own team. As you can see there, you know, Adam Fennell Blake, I've been able to cover with Spencer Lenu, Sean Johnson I have had to put on the bench and Nick Arima is my starting half, although he's coming off the bench, so not ideal. Brian Toto um, is injured, and I don't have any reserve centers given up the injuries to Matt Ekavalu, Alex Johnston, Suwali's out for the rest of the season. Toru Harris is still there in my reserve second row forward, so he's out for the rest of the season as well. So as you can see there, I've only got 15 players, so I clearly need to be making some moves this week just to even field a full 17. But say if you're able to rearrange your team and you've got 17 that you can play, unless the person you're trading to is going to offer so much more points value, I would just look to hold trades if possible. I've got five trades in the bank, so hopefully using the two trades this week to get to three is going to set up my team a little bit better, firstly for this week, but also for the rest of the season as well. Just another little tip as well. Um, obviously, just try to prioritize your trades with those who are going to be out for longer term. So for example, Toe Harris, we know, is going to be out for the rest of the season, so he's perfectly fine to sell versus say like an Alex Johnson who yes he is worth a lot more and you can do a lot more with the cash but given the fact that Alex Johnson might return in round 22 23 just the fact that he might be available to play in 23 24 and 25 in my opinion means he's worth the hold same thing could be said say if you're trying to trade between maybe a Brian Toto or an Adam Fennell Blake as a bit of an example obviously that's probably not going to be a realistic case but Adam Fennell Blake might come back in the next couple of weeks versus Toto, who's more likely to miss the rest of the season. So you just want to be prioritizing that. I know it seems a little bit obvious, but just some simple stuff just to make sure that the trades that you're doing are as valuable as possible. So for example, if I look at my team, Brian Toto looks like the biggest sell candidate, given that uh, he's going to be out for probably the rest of the season, and he's also quite expensive at 640k. So it definitely looks like a trade out for me. And then after that, it probably comes down to either maybe a Toe Harris, uh, Sean Johnson or a Matt Ikevalu, given that they're probably going to be out for the rest of the season. And then it, it just becomes a decision as, do I want to strengthen my second row forward, my halfback, or maybe get in another center? So I'll just try to do a similar approach with your team as well. So Brian Toto replacements, I think this is probably going to be the number one question of the round. Uh, I'm going to have two different slides on this one. So not just the five that I put here, there will be another five coming up. These five options that I put here are probably the safer options, I think, to go for to replace Brian Toto. Josh Adokar, Dave Nofaluma, Jordan Rapana, Dan Gagai, and Daniel Tupo. You'll see with these guys that the majority of them have pretty good base and power statistics, so they're not going to give you horrible scores. If you look at, say, especially Nofaluma, Rapana, Gagai, and Tupo, if you look at the past few weeks, Nofaluma scored 53 in base and power statistics last week. Rapana in the past couple of weeks has scored 64, 56, and 53 just in that. Gagai is always pretty safe with a 37, a 33, a 37. You can even see in round 15 against the Broncos, he scored 69 in base and power statistics, so really, really big flaw there. And Tupo is always very solid 
solid with his base. 50, 53, 49, 50, and 43 in the past month of footy for Daniel Tupo. So those four are going to be the very safe options. You know, very similar mold to Brian Toto. You know, high base um, and potentially with a good draw coming up. You know, if these guys are able to just grab even a couple of tries, that we'll see their scores push up into the 70s and 80s, just to kind of you know be a bit of a like for like replacement for Toto. So I definitely like a lot of those four. The bit of the higher flyer option is like a Josh Adokar, who obviously in that. Uh, you know, on the end of that deadly storm attack, is able to get in those massive scores. You can see there previously in the season, he scored 178 in that game against the Rabbitohs, where he scored six tries. He scored 107 just a couple of weeks before that game against the Warriors, and even last week, 95 against the Cowboys. You can even get it done against the big teams like the Roosters, um, scoring 82 points because, to be honest, the Storm can just pile points on anyone. So Adokar to me looks the most matchup proof in that sense because the Storm are that good. The only issue I have with Adokar is basically the Melbourne Storm just resting players and I'm a bit fearful that they're going to do it towards the back end of the season. Obviously Adokar is a winger so he doesn't have the same kind of you know output of you know effort compared to like your middle forwards. That does still though give me a little bit of concern but out of the other four that I mentioned here I really like a Dan Gagai because the Raptors draw is not too bad for the rest of the season. He's also a lot less owned than a Josh Adokar. Adokar is around 16% and I think Gagai is around 6% so he's a lot more of that point of difference and he definitely also has that ceiling you can see those you know a couple of games where he scored 149 115 so he definitely has that ceiling in him and I really like the Rabbitohs they seem to you know towards the back end of the season ramp up their attack and so I can see some big points on offer for Gagai so I really like him as a replacement Nofaluma the the good thing about him is this is price he's priced at around 430k so he offers pretty good value I've currently got Nofaluma in my team as you previously saw and I'm really happy with to have him for the rest of the season because the Tigers draw as you can see there is very strong apart from that one game against the Panthers in round 24. Rapana is also again a bit of a point of difference you know he's done so well at fullback and and in recent weeks he's been amassing plenty of tackle breaks which is just like you know very easy points for super coach Raiders themselves looked like they've turned a corner and so I think you know that draw is not too bad as well because you've got obviously a tough game against the Storm and also the Roosters in round 25 but the, the games outside of that aren't too bad so I do like Rapana as a bit of a point, point of difference as well but out of these five safe safer options if I want to call it that I think Adokar and Dan Gagai are my kind of two you know premium picks to go for not for Luma if you want to go for a little bit more of a cheaper option um, I think if you want to go for an out of car you're looking for that really really high ceiling but obviously you have to understand that his base statistics are not quite as high as a Gagai so he's you know he can be liable to give you like a 20 or a 30 whereas Gagai is more likely to give you like a 40 um, and probably be a little bit more consistent so I think it really depends if you're looking for that really kind of high ceiling uh, Josh out of car or you're looking for a bit of a safer 70 to 80 from a Dan Gagai. Now the next five options that I've got for, Bri for Brian Toto replacements are definitely more your left field options. So I've got Bradman Best, Joey Manu, Katoni Staggs, Corey Thompson, and Dallin Wateni Zelezniak. So Bradman Best, I mean, he's just been named to come back from injury this week. He's had a horrid run of injuries this season, and he's so far in his you know pretty brief career he's had quite a few injuries that does give me some concern but the best thing about him is that the Knights draw is fantastic this would really be taking a really big punt I don't think I'd be doing it myself just given that with your low trades I think you really want to be making the best use out of them and so going for a bad invest is a real big risk but I think if you're you know if you've got a high risk appetite and you look well you know willing to go there I don't mind Bradman Best because as you can see, he's got a very good floor himself. His base and power sometimes gets up into like 59. There are a couple of games with like 57, 49. Um, and if he's just able to find the try line, uh, he's able to get those really big scores. I think the return of Mitch Pierce is going to be really important for the Knights as well. If, for example, we see Mitch Pierce, you know, be named to play this week in the final 17, I would much prefer going for a Bradman Best or I'd go for him with more confidence just because I know the Knights team in general is going to be a lot better off um, and also with Ponga pulling the strings down the left hand side Bradman Best can definitely profit there. Joey Manu what I like about him is that he's been named on the wing for the Roosters. Playing on the wing just seems to be so much pr more profitable for um, Supercoach center wings this season given that they're always going to be on the end of these sweeping plays. He himself has got you know exceptional talent and uh, I don't know much about his finishing ability because we normally see him always play in the center wing. But if you look at the past few weeks, he's been doing amazingly well. 97, 89, 79, that's his last three games. And so I also like Manu as a purchase option for center wing. Um, I just do think it is a bit more of a risk given that the Rooster draw isn't amazing. But the way that they played last week against the Knights was very impressive. So I don't actually mind going for a Joey Manu as well. Tony Staggs, again, this is a bit of a flyer. Um, you know, this is more based on his pedigree and what we know he can produce 
rather than what he actually has produced so far in 2021. You know, he's only played the three games for scores of 64, 50, and 43. But I don't actually mind that Broncos draw for the rest of the season. You know, Cowboys, the Knights, Roosters, granted, is a bit tough. And then you've got the Warriors, Sharks, and the Knights again. Really, I don't think that's a bad draw for Katoni Staggs because we know that what he can produce is really, really big scores into the 100 plus because he's got such great line breaking, tackle breaking ability. Um, he used to have goal kicking, which definitely added to his ceiling, which he doesn't have at the moment. Uh, but I still think Staggs, you know, if you're looking for a real point of difference, he could also be an option to replace Toto. Corey Thompson, I spoke about him a little bit last week as well. Um, he scored 48 last round, which is not too bad, and he's always got pretty decent tackle breaking ability, so his floor is not bad. As you can see, base and power of the last three weeks was 37, 36, and 38. So he's not going to give you these horrid scores. And the next two weeks for the Titans are really, really strong with the Bulldogs and then the North Queensland Cowboys. They do have a tough two game stretch there with the Rabbitohs and the Melbourne Storm, but again, the last two weeks is very good with the Knights and uh, the Warriors. Tanya Zeleznak, look, this is a real point of difference, like kind of, you know, throw a dart on the wall and see if it sticks because the Warriors draw is very good for the rest of the season. You know, Tigers, Sharks, Bulldogs, Broncos, Raiders, and Titans. Again, that is fantastic. The problem I have is that the Warriors have been ravaged with injuries, um, and I don't know how well they're going to go, especially losing a key player like Roger Tuovasashek is going to be a big blow for them. So this one really is, I think, if you're like a super Warriors fan and you want to get more of their players, maybe you can go for DWZ. Dan Gagai, Josh Adokar, I think are the numbered one and two um, options for me. And if you're looking for a more point of difference, I would probably go with a Corey Thompson and also probably a Katoni Staggs. Now, one question I also got during the week was, you know, do we hold or do we sell Sean Johnson? Based on the injury timeline that we've been given, four weeks is the best case scenario, and that would see him return in round 24 when the Sharks have the Broncos, and then in round 25, I'm pretty sure they've got the Melbourne Storm. So two tough games, but that's the best case scenario. Given that SJ has had previous hamstring issues um, and a lot of niggling injuries, I wouldn't expect him to see him for the rest of the season. So I think he's probably definitely leaning in that kind of sell category versus a hold. But again, it's one of these cases where I don't think you have to rush into it, depending on who you're looking to bring in. Say, for example, if you're dead set on bringing back Nathan Cleary, Sean Johnson is probably going to be your ticket to a Nathan Cleary. So for that reason, you know, you wouldn't be trading out SJ this week. That's something I'm potentially looking at doing as well. Um, you know, maybe having him be my ticket to Cleary in the future, if Cleary comes back, looks pretty good. Because then if you've got the trades to bring in Nathan Cleary for like rounds you know, 24, 25, and even rounds 23, he could be a serious point of difference. Uh, and that's definitely something I'm thinking about. If you're, say, looking to, you know, straight away bank the points at halfback and 5'8", because it is a position that does provide a lot of upside, I think there are four good options I've got here. Jerome Hughes, Daly Cherry Evans, Adam Dewey, and Cam Munster. So I'll quickly touch on the Melbourne Storm boys. So Jerome Hughes and Cam Munster have been doing really, really well um, so far this season. Munster has been averaging 88 or so in the past three weeks with a big score against the Roosters. And Jerome Hughes has been doing very, very well so far this season. He's got six scores over 90 plus this uh, so far this season. The issue I have, again, is similar to Adokar. I just I think the Storm are going to rest a lot of their big gun players because they've basically sewn up the minor premiership, in my opinion. And there's no need for them to be you know pushing these guys that hard. So that is potentially one consideration I have, you know, if you're looking to really kind of push the overall rankings. Yes, obviously, there's one thing to think about is that, you know, Jerome Hughes scoring 120 in one week is going to be better than settling for someone else who will give you 60 over two games. Um, you know, well, basically it breaks even, even though he's played the one less game. But that is something I'm thinking about as well. Jerome Hughes and is not really a point of difference anymore. Munster is a, a point of difference. So I really like Munster more as a bit of a buy as a replacement for Sean Johnson. Obviously, this is depending on, you know, if you've got Johnson in the halfback or the 5'8 position. But I like Munster probably more, given that he's less owned than a Jerome Hughes. Daily Cherry Evans is the other halfback who I'm really um, thinking hard, long and hard about whether I want to be bringing him in this week. He's 767k, which is the big downside is that he's super, super expensive. I feel like the boat has kind of sailed on him as well. You know, his past three rounds, he's, scored an, he's averaging 125, and he's got like a five-game average of like 115. It's ridiculous. And at that price now, he's super expensive, um, and he's just as likely to give you maybe a 20 or a 30 versus like 110, 115. Um, and he tends to do that in those tough matchups. Mainly do have the Storm in rounds 21, I think it is. And then they've got the Eels in round 22. So that's two tough games where Cherry Evans might only score maybe like a 30 or 40, and then his price is going to tank after that. And I think if you do commit to buying a DCE, then you're basically ruling yourself out, in my opinion, of going to an Nathan Cleary. 
That said, I think Cherry Evans probably offers the highest upside of a halfback um, outside of Jerome Hughes, so I still do think he's a good buy. Personally, I'm not fully convinced that at the moment. I mean, this might change in the next couple of days, you know, as my brain always is tinkering with trades throughout the rest of the week. I'm sure you guys can all relate to that. But at the moment, I'm potentially leaning to just holding SJ um, until maybe we get some better news on Nathan Cleary. Uh, otherwise, I'll probably just maybe make a move to a Cherry Evans. If you've got the ability to trade SJ to a 5'8". I really still like Adam Dewey. He's got a three-round average of 110. He's still decently priced at 650k. Obviously, that is a lot of money, but still with a relatively low break, even of 19. The Tigers' draw for the rest of the season is fantastic. And Dewey, with his goal kicking, is always looking heavily involved with the Tigers' attack. Um, I think he's going to be pushing a lot of 100-plus scores for the rest of the season. And so I really like Adam Dewey as a buy. I think he's probably going to be the safest bet out of these four, given that I don't expect him to be rested for the rest of the season. He goal kicks, which is something that none of these other guys have, you know, bar Nathan Cleary. And I think he's probably got the best draw out of anyone here as well. So Adam Dewey, you know, if you're able to make the dual positions work and get a 5-8 in, I still really like Dewey as a purchase. Now, I will also quickly touch on, you know, Tohu Harris replacements, given that, you know, I've still got Tohu Harris in my team, and I think a lot of people will still be looking to bring in a second row forward or even a front row forward via Tohu. I think Payne Haas is probably going to be the number one option to go for in front row forward if you don't have him already and you've got the trades to work with. Payne Haas has been killing it the past three rounds. I'm really happy I pulled the trigger on him in round 16. With Flegler being suspended for two games, you know, Lodge is out now for the Broncos. Payne Haas has already been playing big minutes. He played 72 minutes last round. I only see that kind of either staying the same or increasing. Um, he has had attacking stats in the last three games, which has definitely been pushing up his scores. But the, the thing is, is that the Broncos draw isn't bad. You know, maybe we're just seeing the you know the best of Payne Haas at the moment, and that's just going to continue to be the way it is. So I still really like Payne Haas as a buy for front row forward if you're looking to trade Tohu and you've got the right dual position players to work with that. Um, I, I went in quite a bit of depth into these second row forward options last week, so I will probably won't go into it as much this round. I still think there are a few guys that I really, really like as buyers, namely Angus Crichton, Tyson Frizzell, and maybe a Ryan Madison. So Cam Murray probably would be one of the better options, but he has been suspended this week, so you obviously can't go for him. Again, it's a case of, you know, if you're able to field at 17 and not have to make the trade this round, you could just wait till next week and then bring in Murray. But if you're looking to bring in someone this week, I really like Tyson Frizzell as a buy if Mitchell Pierce does actually get named in the 17, that's definitely one thing I'm looking at doing myself, given that he's pretty solid with his base. He averages around 50 to 55 in base statistics. Um, and with Mitch Pierce back in the side and with that easy draw for the Knights, he hopefully does get some attacking stats and could be a real good point of difference for the run home. So I really like Frizzell and he's pretty cheap at 490k. Angus Crichton is more of your safe bet. You know, you know you're not going to go wrong with Crichton. He averages around 75, or he does average around 75 for the whole season. So he's been very, very solid for the whole year. He even played in the centres for a lot of the last week's game and still was able to generate some attacking stats as well. So he just seems to always get the points no matter what position he plays in. So Crichton is going to be your safe bet. Frizzell is going to be for more of your point of difference play. And if you're looking to say, you know, 130 odd K. Murray, if he was playing, would be a great pickup. Tamalolo, I'm still obviously not super keen on. I mean, he only scored around 40 last week against the Melbourne Storm. It was the Storm, and they basically make anyone score less than they normally do, but I'm still not fully convinced on Tamalolo. Madison, I think, in the past couple of weeks has been very, very good. He scored 135 a couple of weeks ago and 72 last week in a beaten effort against the Raiders. Yes, the Eels draw is very tough. But Madison, as I mentioned previously, he does play a lot of those bigger minute games in those tough matchups. And with a very, very solid base, you know, you're not going to get bad scores out of Madison. So I think he is a very good purchase um, as a replacement for Toe Harris moving forward. Brandon Smith and Luciano Le Lua are put in there as a bit of a you know point of difference. Well, not necessarily Brandon Smith because he's very, very highly owned. Um, but at 644k, I think there's all these other guys are probably going to offer similar output. Harry Grant also coming back. We, who knows what that's going to do with Brandon Smith's minutes. So for that reason, I don't think I'd be going for a Brandon Smith. And Luciano Le Lua is more of a point of difference, purely based on the Tigers' draw and the fact that he's pretty cheap at 474k. But in my opinion, I think Frizzell, Crichton, and Madison are the three guys that I'd be going for. And if you're able to save it for next week, I think Cam Murray is definitely up there as well as one of the better options to go with, as he's got amazing attacking stats and his ceiling is very, very high. So another kind of point of discussion as well is fullbacks for the rest of the season. I went into quite a bit of detail about this last week as well, so I probably won't do so this week. I think given all the injury carnage, it's going to be a little bit harder to go for some of these fullbacks. Like for example, I've got Clint Gutherson. Um, at the moment, I can't justify selling him at, um, even because he is basically healthy and playing. Um, obviously, with that draw for the Eels, is very, very tough. Tedesco showed how good he can be um, for Supercoach with a massive 146 last week against the Knights. 
Personally, the approach I'm taking is that, you know, Tom Trebovich is not going anywhere for me. If you're a Clint Gutherson owner, I'm, you know, very conservative myself. So I'm probably going to be holding Gutherson for this week. You know, it gives me another opportunity to see how Ryan Pappenhausen goes. He is being played off the bench again. So his price is going to continue to tank. Caleb Ponga looks like he's had a bit of a niggling sternum injury. The Raiders have been pretty good defensively, actually, in the past couple of weeks. So I think Ponga, again, it's a good week to assess to see how he performs. Tedesco, again, coming up against the Eels, that's a relatively tough matchup. I think the only options that you're really wanting to go for this week, if you're looking to maximize points, is probably a Latrell Mitchell, given that he's working, versing a very weak Dragons team this week. And he's got three good games in the next season with Dragons, Titans, and Dragons again towards the back end of the season. Um, there's been some talk as well about Adam Reynolds potentially being rested this week. Definitely want to keep an eye on because if that is the case, the trail should actually be goal kicking. If that's the case, I really like the trail as a buy. Reese Walsh has also retained the goal kicking and it looks like it's going to be that way for the rest of the season. The Warriors draw is very strong. I, as I mentioned though, I am a bit concerned about the Warriors attack in general with all the injuries they have. Um, so that's again a big risk about around Walsh. Adam Dewey is eligible to be um, play it at fullback. Honestly, there's no, you know, it's not a horrible option to go for Dewey because he's that good for Supercoach. You know, he's averaging 77 for the entire season. But I think you're probably wanting to get Dewey up into 5'8 instead of in the fullback position. But in my opinion, I think Ponga, Pappenhausen, and Tedesco are the three best options to go for, in my opinion. Although Pappenhausen, uh, you know, he did look a little bit shaky um, in his return from that concussion, which is completely understandable. So that potentially might rule him out. So I think in my opinion, it probably gets down to either a Kalen Ponga or a Tedesco. Otherwise, if you're low on trades and you've got Clint Gutherson, he's been pretty solid so far this year. So I don't think he's the worst hold. But yes, that draw is going to be very tough for the Eels. The benefit is that he could be goal kicking with Mitch Moses out. And so that definitely does add maybe 10 to 15 points to his average moving forward. So we'll get into the vice captaincy and captaincy candidates for the round. Um, it looks pretty straightforward for myself for vice captaincy and captaincy, but there are definitely a few good matchups that can be targeted this round. Tedesco versus the Eels could be a good vice captain option. You know, given he's got 146 against the Knights last week, he looks back to his best, kind of overcome that hip pointer injury. And, you know, why are we questioning Tedesco? You know, before the beginning of the season, he was the man to go for. Um, obviously, all the injuries that the Roosters have sustained has definitely impacted his um, super coach output. But, you know, how much longer is he going to watch Tommy Turbo absolutely kill it and just decide, you know what, it's my turn? So I think if you've got Tedesco, he could be a good vice captaincy option. Adam Dewey against the Warriors is, all again, in my opinion, a great vice captain given that he's got that goal kicking. He scored 80 last week again. And he just seems to always be able to find the points. The Warriors have been pretty good at defending 5-8, so they're the 10th worst. So there's only other f a few other teams who are actually better at defending 5-8. But given all the injuries to the Warriors, I think Dewey is looking like a great vice-captain option. Reese Walsh, you know, maybe could also be a vice-captain. I mean, this is going to be a real, you know, f real big point of difference play if you go for a vice-captaincy on Reese Walsh. The Tigers have been the 5th worst at defending fullbacks. He is goal-kicking, which is the only reason I would consider him as a vice-captain. But yeah, really, really big risk, that one. I think the vice captaincy that myself and a lot of other people are going to be going with is vice captaincy Cody Walker versus the Dragons. The Dragons have been pretty decent at defending 5 8s, ninth best in the competition. But, you know, Cody Walker and the Rabbitohs have just seemed to be scoring points for fun. They scored 60 last week against the Warriors. The Dragons uh, are still going through that kind of thing where they're. Uh, a lot of their players who went to the barbecue are being suspended, so their team has got a lot of changes this round, so they're definitely a lot weaker, and as a result, I think Cody Walker could be a great vice-captain option and, and probably going to be my vice-captain for, for the week. Kalen Ponga, if you do jump on early on Ponga versus the Raiders, who have been the sixth worst at defending fullbacks, could be also a very good vice-captain option. The downside is that Ponga hasn't been goal-kicking recently. That has been going to Jake Clifford, but Ponga, he's still able to pull out big 120-plus point scores, even without goal-kicking, because he's that he's just that good. So I really like Ponga as a vice-captaincy. Again, this is also going to be a real point of difference play. The two best captaincy options, in my opinion, because they do play later in the round, is Dave Fafida and Tom Trevojevic. Fafida against the Bulldogs, who've been the worst team at defending edge back rows. Look, Fafida came off the bench last week and scored 134. That's how good he is. You know, he's just like, give me the ball, let me run at these weaker defenders, and I'll just go over for a try. He also provided a try assist for Greg Marzu. Gets like 10, 12 tackle breaks a game, easy as. So Fafida against a weak Bulldogs team could be in for a big game this round. But it's hard to look past Tom Trevojevic just based on how well he's been going so far this season. He scored 95 last week and looked overall underwhelming, if you can call it that. 
against the Sharks, who have been the 11th worst at defending fullbacks. So they've been pretty good at actually keeping opposition fullbacks to lower scores. But this is Tommy Turbo we're talking about, the best fullback in the game for Supercoach. Some are even talking about in the NRL, and maybe James Tedesco has got some, something to say about that. But for Supercoach purposes, you, it's hard to go past Tom Dravovich, captain this round. Um, and that's the way I'm probably going to be going this week. So we'll just get into a bit of our break-evens analysis for the round. Out of the Broncos, I think Tony Staggs and Payne Haas were the two main trade targets that I flagged for this week. I think the other option that you could go for if you're looking for that Brian Toto replacement is potentially Tessie New. He's got a high break-even of 65 at 430k though. That's a pretty cheap price and he's been pretty solid playing out of fullback. So I don't actually mind him that this, again, definitely a big point of difference play. But I do like the Broncos draw for the rest of the season. So he could be a decent pickup. Again, one, if you're looking to wait and maybe assess, his break-even is high enough that you could wait a week on that. Out of the Bulldogs, I'm not interested in any of their players. Sorry, Bulldogs fans. For the Raiders, I think Jordan Rapana is the key guy to be looking at. He's got a very low break, even of 14 at 488k. You know, his price is going to be peaking around 500k plus in the next few weeks. So I think if you're looking for that Toto replacement, obviously this week you're probably looking to go for it if you're trading out Toto and Rapana is at a pretty decent price there. Quick shout out as well to Corey Harionairo, who's been doing super well for me ever since I brought him in. I got that big 124 out of him a couple of weeks ago and he scored 88 last week against the Eels. I don't know if I'd be going out and buying him for Toby Harris, uh, given that the Raiders draw is a bit tough for the rest of the season. But if you were looking to go with him, he also has a low break even of 14 and at 580k could be decent value, but I but I probably do prefer an Angus Crichton or a Tyson Frizzell in my opinion. Out of the Dragons, Matt Fiungai at minus 110 break even. He is one of the most popular cheapies of the week. It, do, it does feel like it's a little bit late in the season to be going for someone like this unless you're looking to generate a lot of cash and you've got the trades to be able to bring him in and also trade him out again. I probably wouldn't advocate for him as a buyer, but I can understand if you're in that you know luxurious situation of having multiple trades um, to be able to afford to bring him in and bring him out again, he, he will be a very good cash grab for you, that is for sure. With Morgan Harper out of the seat, he was probably deserves a shout out with that minus 34 break even. He's got a massive 141 last week. He has actually had a bit of interest as well based on the trade-ins that I've looked at. But the last couple of weeks, he's done obviously that 141 and then the 60 the week prior to that. But before that, most of his scores were around the 30s and 40s. So I don't think I'd be advocating for a Morgan Harper buy, in my opinion. Cherry Evans as a flag before with an 8 break even at 767k. If you're looking to bring him in, I think this is the week that you have to pull the, pick, pull the pin on him. I'll quickly mention Nico Hines out of the storm. He's got a high, he's got a high break, even though 105, but I think given what we've seen so far this round, there's no reason for me to sell him in my opinion. I feel like he's been playing too well as recently that I feel like there's going to make they're going to make a role for him in the 17. And even if he's coming off the bench, look, to be honest, the fact that he's an active player who we can, you know, have in our 17s, I don't think I'm going to be trading him. And to be honest, he's probably looking more like a hold for the rest of the season. Out of the Knights, so there's a few players who I've you know flagged there, like a Tyson Frizzell, a Kalen Ponga, or even a Bradman Best. With Ponga's break even of 168, again, it gives you a good opportunity to wait this week and see how he goes against the Raiders. He could be priced around 520, 530k next week. So even if you are holding on to Clint Gutherson, um, you know, you're still going to be making a lot of money trading Gutho to Ponga next week if you can make that work. So I don't think there's any reason to rush into that unless you're obviously looking to capitalize on that better matchup um, compared to a Gutherson. The Cowboys, to be honest, not interested in any of their players. Again, with the Eels, my interest in them is limited because of that really tough draw. Um, I would just, yeah, to be honest, I wouldn't be buying any of their players, except for maybe in their forwards, given that they're more going to be reliant on their base stats. Um, but I wouldn't be looking at any of their attacking players. Similar to the Panthers, which has been a bit funny, given that how well they were to begin how good they were to begin the season. With all the injuries they've had, namely to Nathan Cleary, they just haven't really been performing as well in the past few weeks. I mean, for them, it was tough for them to even beat the Brisbane Broncos. I think we're all just waiting on Nathan Cleary and that really high break even of 221. Hopefully he's able to come back next week in round 21. We get an opportunity to see him play maybe a couple of games and maybe his price is a little bit more affordable and that he could be a really strong point of difference option to go for for the rest of the season if you've got the trades to be able to bring him in. Out of the Sharks, Siona Katoa had a big game last week scoring 122. He could be a good option as well to replace Toto with a minus five break even. You know, he's probably you know at the bottom of his price. My, my concern now with the Sharks, and especially someone like Katoa who plays on the right-hand side, is that without Sean Johnson, I just don't know how good their attack's going to be because Johnson looked really strong in that first half last week against the Bulldogs, but unfortunately he picked up that injury. But Katoa, yeah, he could be a point of difference option as well to go for. Um, the Sharks' draw for the rest of the season isn't that bad, but I just don't, I think there are going to be better options, in my opinion. 
for the Rabbitohs, Damian Cook has got a very low break even of three. Um, he's been doing this all season. He's been giving you massive 100 point scores every now and then. And then he goes back to giving you 50s and 60s. Not even the 60s. He gives you 40s and 50s to be honest. So personally, I'm not looking to bring Damian Cook in myself. And I just, I mean, I, it really depends if you've got a lot of trades to be able to make those moves at hooker position. Personally, I, I don't. And even if I did, I'd be looking to go for Harry Grant now that he is back compared to a Damian Cook. The Roosters, there's a few players who have generated some interest recently. Victor Radley has actually been doing really well in the past three weeks. He's got a pretty decent break even of six. So if you are looking to go a bit more budget in your second row forward to replace, say, a Toe Harris, or, you know, if you're looking to replace a center wing and you've got the right dual position players to make the switch, you could go for Victor Radley at that lower price of 429k. Um, his minutes have been inflated in the past few weeks with Takiyaho out. That is one thing to note, but he's been able to get some attacking stats as well, and you can definitely see his impact on the Roosters attack overall. So I think Victor Radley could be a good also point of difference option for your second row forward. Similar goes with Satili Tupanua, who scored a massive 100 plus point game last week. He's got a very decent break even of 17. The only thing is that at 546k, he's a bit too reliant on the attack stats for my own opinion. And I think I'd much rather prefer paying, you know, 60k less and going for a Tyson Frizzell. For the Titans, I mean, Greg Marzu does look appealing with that low break even of 9 at 324k. Two good games coming up for the Titans. The only problem is that Philip Sammy is due to come back in around round 22 or round 23, and he might potentially take the position that Marzu is currently occupying. That is my only issue with going for a Marzu, but otherwise he could be a good downgrade option, but I think there's too much risk around his position that I wouldn't be going for him personally myself. Dave Fafida, his break even is 63. There's no better time to get him. Just get him into the team if you haven't already. For the Warriors, I think I've spoken an, a, quite a bit about the player that I'd be potentially interested in, like maybe a Reese Walsh or a Dallin Wilton, he's a Lesniak, but again, not too many options I think to consider there, given the injury toll that they've had. And out of the Tigers, Adam Dewey, Dave Nofluma, two good trading targets that I've mentioned. Dane Laurie potentially could also be someone that you look to bring back in. You know, playing out at fullback, he's been doing pretty well for, this, for the duration of this season. He's pretty decently priced at 489k. With a break even of 42, I think he's probably um, at a decent price where you can pick him up and he could go up a little bit in price, although you're not looking to be you know, as concerned about that at this point in the season. But I think he could be able to average 65 to 70, you know, based on the draw that the Tigers have for the rest of the season. So I also don't mind him as a pickup as well to replace Brian Toto. So we'll give a quick update on the group league. So top scorer was William in round 19 with a massive 1,597. Um, overall rank of 15,000, but you know what? I'll take that 1,597 because I scored 300 points less than that last round. And in our top five overall, um, Andrew from Eliminators is still doing amazingly well. Overall rank of seven. Um, Andrew, I hope you've got more than four trades. Um, otherwise, good luck, my friend. <laughs> um, and just behind him, we've got Jason, Marcelo, James, and Andy. We're all sitting in the top 250 overall. Jason is in the top 100. Um, and I think it's going to be a really, really you know, important period of the season now. So apparently, there's some statistic um, uh, produced by the SE Playbook that 26% of the top 1,000 have got nine players missing. So that's like that's like one quarter of the top 1,000 have got less than 17 fit players this round. So as we can see, you know, if trades are low and they've got that kind of injury situation, I think there's a really, really wide open field now. So I think for these guys who are really highly ranked, it's going to be super important that they're very conservative with their trades and also nail their captaincy picks as well, just to try and get up to number one position. Well, that's it, guys. That is the round 20 trade targets and preview, or shall we just call it the carnage round, because this round has been absolutely ridiculous. Let me know in the comments below. Which players have you got injured? I'll just quickly tally mine off again. Alex Johnson, Brian To'o, Matt Ekovalu, To'o Harris, Sean Johnson, Adam Fennell Blake. I've got six guys currently. Throw in Joseph Swali, make that seven. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm hit pretty hard. So let me know in the comments below. Uh, which players you've also got injured and maybe what trades you're looking to do and as always any questions you've still got that maybe this question this video didn't address let me know in the comments below and i'll see i'll do my best to get back to you on that if you enjoyed the video as always i'd appreciate a smash on the like button do please consider subscribing to the channel as well if you've enjoyed this content and i'll see you guys in the next video